It's Friday afternoon. Let's talk some TNA. So last night was the first official TNA broadcast that was on the road. They were at the Sears Center in Chicago, Illinois. And to start our show off, we saw a video package about what happened Sunday night at lockdown when Bully Ray turned on the fans and everyone in the company and was revealed as Aces and Eights president and became the new TNA World Heavyweight Champion. Now, I predicted that Bully Ray would win the title. I wasn't sure if there would be a turn or not, but it seemed like the writing was already on the wall. So, Bully Ray is a better heel and a uber heel, to be exact. So, it made sense for him to be world champion as a heel and not a babyface. The match was really good. I very much enjoyed it. I loved Bully Ray's sit-out powerbomb off the top of the cage. It looked amazing. And I'm sure Hardy was feeling it the next morning. So, awesome match. And they th they had a Bash at the Beach moment where the ring was filled with trash after the match was over. And after Bully Ray proclaimed himself the president of Aces and Eights. So, basically, we are now here at the Sears Center Arena in Chicago, Illinois. And... We're hyping the return of AJ Styles, who's going to show up tonight. And Bully Ray's the first appearance as a World Heavyweight Champion. So we start the match with what is supposed to be a World Tag Team title match between Chavo Guerrero Jr. and Hernandez against the World Tag Team Champions Bobby Roode and Austin Aries. When Chavo and Hernandez make their way to the ring with uh, kind of a mixed reaction from the crowd, to be totally honest, completely different from Sunday night when they got extreme cheers but uh, they kind of got booed a bit, to be totally honest. But It was all for nothing, pretty much. As soon as they got in the ring, Aces and Eights came out and jumped them from behind and started beating the daylights out of them. So Aces and Eights pretty much laced a waste to the former tag team champions. They toss Chavo and Hernandez out of the ring. Devon gets on the mic and tells the crowd to sit down and shut up. Then he furthermore says Aces and Eights will be dominating TNA from this point forward and introduces the new... TNA World Heavyweight Champion. Now, during this entire segment, Garrett Bischoff is holding Bully Ray's Aces and Eights jacket, obviously, and Bully comes down, and basically, this is awesome too, by the way, the Aces and Eights themes, which is called Dead Man's Hand, I believe, finally gets lyrics! So, Bully Ray gets lyrics for the Aces and Eights theme, and that was awesome because I think it's really good and really, rel really well done because I very much enjoy the Aces and Eights theme. So, Bully comes to the crowd to the Aces and Eights theme, which does have lyrics now. He stares down the crowd, and if you remember back in the day, back in ECW, when the Dudleys used to come to Chicago, oh my god, the riots that Bully Ray used to start. And uh, now... He's World Heavyweight Champion, so it'll be interesting to see exactly what happens here. So Bully stops the announce table and hugs Taz, of course, as the ruse was complete, and hands the World Heavyweight Championship to Garrett Bischoff. Like I said to myself last night when I was watching this, that's the closest Garrett Bischoff is ever getting to that title. And of course they give him his Aces and Eights vest, and he does their pose. And pretty much everyone in the group, except for strangely Mr. Anderson and Garrett Bischoff, follow suit. So Bully grabs the mic and drapes the title over his shoulder, in true heel fashion. He asks the crowd if they know who he is, obviously. Introduces himself as the president of the Aces and Eights and the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. Bully says he's the man who made a fool out of Hulk Hogan, and he screwed Brooke Hogan. He also says he's the guy who made a fool out of each and every one of the TNA fans. For nine months, the Aces and Eights pulled the wool over the fans' eyes. Bully tells Devon and the rest of the Aces and Eights how proud he was of them last Sunday for helping him win the World Heavyweight Championship. Ray says when he drilled the hammer into the back of Jeff Hardy's head, he never felt more proud. Ray says it wasn't originally supposed to happen that way because he was supposed to leave the cage when Wes and Garrett hit the ring. But it didn't happen due to the talk that Hulk Hogan gave him before the match. So the crowd starts getting really intense, and they start chanting Hogan at the top of their lungs, which kind of stops Bully Ray momentarily, but he continues once again saying he couldn't give a damn about Hulk Hogan's advice, and did in one night 
with aces and eights what the NWO could never accomplish. Okay. So, Ray begs Hogan to come out and fire them from TNA. Ray tells the crowd to chant his name all they want because he won't fire them. Ray says, when you ride with the aces and eights, you'll never walk alone. I like that statement. That's nice. And we start the theme again. Ray raises the title in the air and everyone else does the, the hand signal. Okay. So, we thought we were going to see a tag team title match. And that was almost the last we saw of Chavo Hernandez for the evening until the... Uh, Schmaz at the end, but I'll talk about that as we progress in this video. Now, um, Aces and Eights did get defeated cleanly at Lethal Lockdown. So, basically, you had not much momentum, except for the fact that Wes Briscoe, thanks to D'Lo Brown, stole a victory over Kurt Angle. And, of course, Bully Ray became World Heavyweight Champion. So, Aces and Eights did what they needed to do at Lockdown, even though they lost. That makes any sense at all. So, we get to Sting backstage, and he's mad beyond words about Bully Ray's words. He promises to get his hands on Bully, and he said, I need to talk to Hulk Hogan first. So, Sting throws a water bottle, and he yells at a random stagehand. Basically, um, have you seen The Room? Hi, Juliet. If you've seen The Room, you would know that at the very end of the movie, after everything happens, the main character, Johnny throws the worst temper tantrum in the history of the world. And basically just throwing things, I don't care anymore, it doesn't matter, don't care, and throws things to the side, and just pushes things aside. Literally, he just could care less, honestly. But, um, because he basically his best friend just stabbed him in the back by, uh, sleeping with his girl, so needless to say, he's kind, he should be angry and frustrated, but he's like, I don't care, I'm fed up with this world. But, you know, honestly, that's what Sting did to me. He threw a Johnny fit. That's basically what he did. And uh, the tantrum was kind of laughable, to be totally honest. Commercial break brought us back to last Sunday at Lockdown, where we saw the physicality between Gail Kim and Taryn Terrell. Obviously, Gail Kim slaps Taryn Terrell, and Taryn Terrell retaliates with a spear and then pounding her with rights and lefts. And, of course, Gail Kim thinks that cost her the Knockouts Championship. So, Gail makes her way to the ring for the actual first match of the night. And, basically, we find out that Taryn Terrell is currently on probation because of touching Gail Kim at lockdown. So, Gail basically does one of the little, like, superstars picture-in-picture -picture promos, saying she's on probation, she wishes Brooke Hogan the best, and then we see Tara come out with Jesse Goddard's, as usual. And basically, here comes Mickey James making her return to TNA Impact and Velvet Sky. So we're going to see a tag team matchup with Gail Kim and Tara against Mickey James and the Knockouts champion Velvet Sky. So this was the first match of the evening. And as usual, we're going to go back and forth here. After the commercial break, we come back. Tara tags in, continuing to beat Mickey down. And Mickey fights out of the corner, but Tara floats over the corner splash, ties her up in the tarantula, which we haven't seen for quite a while. Of course, she has to break it because she's holding the ropes. So, because that's the point of the move. So, Tara distracts Tara and Terrell, allowing Gail Kim to send Mickey to the mat with a cheap shot. James gets rolled back into the ring. Tara covers her, but only a two count. So, Gail Kim tags in and takes Mickey down for another two count. She chokes James in the corner with her boot, arguing with Tara and Terrell while getting up in her face. This distraction allows James to connect with a Hurricane Rana out of the corner. And James and Kim both run at each other, connecting with the clothesline, and we have our double down for this match. So Tara tags in, and hot tag to Velvet Sky, taking Tara down with series of clotheslines. Velvet ducks the clothesline, hits the tilt-a-whirl into a side Russian leg sweep for the 1-2, and Gail Kim makes the save. So once again, Taryn gets into Gail Kim's face, and Kim begs the referee to hit her, obviously. So Kim pie faces her to the canvas again, and Taryn once again slaps her down to the mat. Mickey nails Tara with the seated senton off the top, and Tara takes Mickey down with the widow's peak, which looked amazing. The second that's happened, Gil hooks her up in your face. One, two, three. So once again, we got a nine and a half, almost a ten minute match between four knockouts, and. Like I said, a lot more emphasis is put on the Knockouts title than the Divas Championship. 
But with the WWE supposedly bringing back some former stars, i.e. how the Bellas came back on Raw Monday night, I think that that's going to change. However, this is what we're building at. We have a storyline here between Taryn Terrell and Gail Kim. And like I said, it's going to build to a match. I don't know when or how long we're going to burn this, but it's going to build to a match somewhere down the road. And basically, it was a good tag team match. It was a great knockouts match. Very enjoyable, actually. And uh, one thing that was actually done in the middle of the match, it was really funny. And uh, kind of a, a mess up there from uh, Velvet Sky. She basically goes to tag, and basically she drags her opponent to the corner. When she's dragging her opponent to the corner, she's dragging her opponent to Tara's corner. Yeah, and then she runs over to the opposite side and drags over to Mickey James. So yeah, that was nice and comical, but the match overall was good and a very enjoyable match, and I'd like to see where this is headed. Obviously, we know we're getting Terrence Terrell and Gail Kim somewhere down the road, and we don't have an established challenger to the Knockouts Championship right now, so hopefully we'll get that somewhere soon. We recap what happened earlier on Impact with Bully Ray begging Hulk Hogan to fire aces and eights. Of course, he's not going to. So we catch up with them backstage, and of course they're drinking, as usual, and hanging out, as usual. Bully says, just in case Hulk Hogan does grow the balls to fire them, he wants to propose a toast to the group. They cling bottles together, and they drink. And they drink some more. Bully Ray laughs and says he hasn't heard from his wife in a while, so he calls Brooke, obviously, and goes straight to voicemail. So he leaves this random sarcastic message, putting her on speakerphone so the Aces and Eights can give their uh, condolences, if you will. So Ray says, call me back and says, say hi to Dad for me. All right. Entertaining and very high school, but once again, entertaining. So, of course, we find out once again, as we heard back at lockdown, that Slammiversary 11 is going to be in Boston this year. And ticket packages will be available on ShopTNA.com. So, Hulk Hogan is once again accosted by the mysterious interviewer, who obviously has never seen, refusing to answer any questions, at least not right now. So, Robbie E. makes his way to the ring, and Rob Terry makes his way to the ring. Okay, here's the thing. He's calling himself Rob Terry, but... If I remember correctly, isn't he from, like, Manchester or Cardiff, Wales or somewhere in the UK? And he still announced as from the Jersey Shore. So, you righted the wrong by not calling him Robbie T anymore, even though Todd during commentary actually called him Robbie T quite a bit. But you don't take away his hometown being Jersey as where it's England. So, I don't know where you want to go with this. Doesn't make much sense. So they have a match, and it's a short match. Robbie E. goes at him with a series of rights and lefts. He gets taken down with a shoulder block. So Terry picks him up and tosses him the canvas and face plants him. He hits a running back elbow in the corner and then a power slam from a suplex position. No, not exactly the jackhammer. He literally picked him up in the jackhammer position like the hanging vertical suplex. He stalled with it, put him on his shoulder, and hit him over the shoulder power slam. So still a Goldberg move, but a completely different one. So Robbie E. grabbed Rob Terry's leg, and Terry, of course, peels him off like he's a small child. He picks him up and slams him in the mat with a standing spine buster for the 1-2-3. Now, basically, he picked him up in a powerbomb position, and he turned him around, and the, like I said, the sit-out hanging tree slam. Not good. Not good at all. Um, Robbie E., once again, like I said, puts on the bumping shoes tonight, and Rob Terry continues to suck. Oh, my God. I hate Rob Terry. I think Mason Ryan has more talent than Rob Terry does, and Rob Terry is still on television. So, obviously we didn't get anything out of this other than the fact that Rob Terry wins again, so I don't think we can go any further with this feud because Robbie T has, lost, has won one, twice, and Robbie E has lost twice. So, I think it's probably over, and you need to move them to different feuds. And I don't know exactly where you go from here with either one of them, but I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Terrible match, honestly. So we hear this extreme cheese music, and of course, Rob Terry celebrates by doing some really random things in the ring. Those weird push-ups that make me queasy just thinking about him. <laughs> anyway, so we catch up with Sting backstage, and he enters Hulk Hogan's office, and then we go to commercial. Okay. 
So we have tension right there. We come back from commercial, Aces and Eights are backstage looking at the merchandise they took from the merchant stand. And basically, they realize there's no Aces and Eights merchandise. And so, because there's no Aces and Eights merchandise, there's no beanies, there's no hats, there's no shirts, there's nothing. They grab the Impact program, and they say, flip to the first page, and that is going to be their next target. So Doc does so. And they start laughing, and they get excited about it. Bully says it won't be easy, but they'll get it done. So, um, Aces and Eights have turned from high school bullies to frat guy bullies at this point. In biker vests. So, that's pretty awesome. I like Aces and Eights, I'm not gonna lie. So, back in Hogan's office, Hogan is laying in a sting, reading him the riot act for trusting Bully Ray, and now he's the World Heavyweight Champion. Sting tells Hogan not to fire them because he has an idea. Sting asks for Bully tonight and says, we need this. Hogan says there's no we anymore, and he tells Sting furthermore to get out of his office because he doesn't have time for him and doesn't want to see him right now. Sting makes me sick, and that is his last word. So basically, Sting did really well in what he was doing, and then Hogan just ruined it all by saying, you make me sick. That didn't really make much sense. I really enjoyed it overall until we got to that. And Hogan has a completely justifiable reason to be angry right this moment. But it's kind of strange talking about this is the end of the movie, brother. And I just... It was alright. I mean, it makes sense metaphor-wise. But it sounded kind of hokey, to be totally honest. But not bad overall. So we go back to our announce table, and we are going to hype up the return of AJ Styles tonight. We talk about what happened the last couple of weeks when cameras were sent to Gainesville to talk to AJ, and he's going to return after this commercial break. So, after the commercial break, we are not greeted by AJ Styles, but we are greeted by Austin Aries and Bobby Roode, and they catch Sting in the hallway. And they're wearing these uh, homemade t-shirts that say Dirty Heels. So I don't know if that's going to be their team name or not. I highly doubt it, but you never know. It's TNA. It's possible. So they catch Sting in the hallway, and they admonish him rather sarcastically for not seeing the evil in Bully Ray. Rude says he should be embarrassed because he's the reason that the Aces and Eights are running amok and why Bully Ray is champion. Austin says that since Aces and Eights had attacked their opponents earlier, they don't have a match tonight. So Sting says... Enough. I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm tired of talking. I just want to fight. So Bobby Roode just backs out of camera view. And Austin Aries is left standing by himself completely. And Sting says, I want you tonight. So we get Sting and Austin Aries tonight. First time ever these two have ever met in the ring. And we'll bring up that in a little bit. So we got the return of AJ Styles. Christy Hemme comes out looking beautiful as ever, and she introduces AJ to the ring. His music plays, and he doesn't come out out of nowhere. Bad Influence uh, Tron plays, and they come out. Now, this is awesome, by the way. So they come out. We're in Chicago, mind you. So Daniels and Kazarian are literally dressed completely like the Road Warriors. Head to toe. Literally, the face paint's the same, and Daniels even has... Hawk's double mohawk painted on top of his head. It looks absolutely amazing. So Kaz gets on the so Animal Kaz gets on the mic here and says, "Tonight they are bringing back Throwback Thursday. Don't forget a couple weeks ago. Actually, I'll say even longer than that. It wasn't a couple of weeks ago. The last time we had a Throwback Thursday that I can recall was December 6th, the last TNA Impact I attended at the Impact Zone and they were wearing the Zubaz, and looking a whole lot like Rick Bassman, and that worked. But now Throwback Thursday is, since we're in the second city, they're paying homage to the second best tag team in wrestling history. So Kaz growls out, tell him, Chris! And Daniels gets on the mic and goes, well? And I was like, this is amazing. Chris Daniels and Frankie Kazarian, incredible. Incredible. And what kind of wonderful heat to mock the Road Warriors in Chicago. So they basically say that the Road Warriors were fake tough guys, how AJ Styles is fake tough, and how the Chicago crowd is fake tough. Daniel says bad influence is the real deal, the original Ring Warriors, and the Legion of Boom. Daniels concludes with, ah, what a tush. Yeah, it's glorious. Daniels is amazing. 
And of course, you have the permission to worship us now. Sorry about your damn luck. And then James Storm comes out, of course. And Storm gets in the ring and tells Bad Influence they don't have to run. And basically he's having some mic troubles. He basically says the team that Bad Influence is mocking was bigger, taller, and a whole lot more over than they ever will be. Zing! Storm says he's allowing them to decide which one of them is going to take the beating tonight. So Kaz bails to the floor, so Daniels gets flipped into the ring. And we're going to start this. And that's exactly how we start this. And basically, he's in complete control until Kaz trips him from the outside. So Daniel stomps Storm down in the corner and whips Storm into the buckle with enough form to send him back to the canvas. You know, the Bret Hart, like, whiplash effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel stands on Storm's back to work the back and then a waist lock to wear the cowboy down. So Storm breaks out, caught with a headbutt to the midsection, and Daniels follows up with the uh, Arabian press only for a two count. Daniels gloats to the crowd, connects with a couple of rights to Storm. His cockiness, as usual, is his undoing, as Storm mounts a comeback. Then an atomic drop, then the Bulldog, picks Daniels up, goes for the eye of the Storm. Daniels lands on his feet, goes for the Uranagi, and goes for the best moonsault ever, lands on his feet. Storm moves out of the way, catches him with the closing time. Kaz distracts Storm to prevent the last call. Daniels rebounds with the lung blower, and 1-2-3. Storm wins in a 3-minute and 42-second match. Strange finish? But, um, not bad, and I don't mind seeing these two in the ring together. So after the match is over, Kaz jumps Storm from behind, so bad influence double-team the Cowboy. AJ Styles runs out to the back and goes for the attack, and he punches Kazarian. Daniels powders the outside. So Daniels is staring, Kazarian are on the outside, and AJ is staring a hole into them. Storm goes to talk some trash, and Styles nails him with a clothesline. And then leaves. I like this. I like this a lot. Because foreshadowing the fact that if you really think about it, James Storm is partially the reason 2012 was bad for AJ Styles. Because James Storm is the re one of the partial reasons he is not in the company any longer. I like AJ and his hooded up tormented persona. I agree with this reviewer completely. So last Sunday on Lockdown, we saw Wes Briscoe beating Kurt Angle with the help of D'Lo Brown. Kurt Angle is backstage this time. Wes Briscoe comes up to distract him, and Angle turns around. Aces and eights just bully him from behind. Bully is not actually shown, so it's funny that I said he bullied him from behind. They basically lay him laying, and they exit the scene. We get back from commercial, and Joseph Park is in the ring, wearing a suit and tie. Park says it's an honor and a thrill to be standing in front of the Chicago crowd tonight. It's been a pretty wild past few months for him, getting the first big W in the UK and winning on pay-per-view lockdown. <clears throat> Park fully says, all of this has made him reflect on the highlights of his life. One, graduating law school, the top of his class. Two, being ma making partnership with Park, Park, and Park. I'm not sure how you can make partnership. It takes a long time to make partnership with something, naming your last name twice, and three times, to be exact. The most important highlight is standing in front of his hometown crowd. So Chicago crowd, of course, they mark out the mention that the Mick Foley cheap pop is full in effect tonight. So Park says he grew up sitting baseline at the Cubs games. Ooh, that's not something you say. And apparently there must be White Sox fans. All right. Brings up the Blackhawks game, and they're like, yay! And then Park says nothing has been exciting as being part of the TNA roster, and he can't wait for what's next. Well, what's next is Matt Morgan comes to the ring. He grabs the mic and says... He's going to mock Hulk Hogan for this bully raid situation. He says, out of all of the mistakes that the GM has made, the biggest one concerns the walking joke known as Joseph Park. Basically, Morgan says the fact that Park was signed to a contract is an abortion to the sport of wrestling. That's kind of an extreme way to put it. Morgan tells Hogan he's going to eliminate his mistakes one by one, starting with him. Morgan tells Park to get out of his ring before he knocks all of his teeth out of his head. So Park goes to leave, Morgan insults Chicago, so them be fighting words, and Joseph Park gets back in the ring. He says people from Chicago never back down from a fight, and he challenged Morgan to a fight right now. Morgan laughs and says, basically, this is going to be done on my time, not yours. Morgan shakes his head and pretends to leave the ring, but then a carbon footprint out of nowhere, 
Morgan picks up the mic and says, my time is next week. So we're going to get Joseph Park and Matt Morgan next week. I don't mind this, actually. I like this so much. I like Joseph Park's character overall. And uh, Matt Morgan is kind of on an interesting train right now because you don't know exactly. It's like the destination to nowhere at this point. You don't know what you're going to do with him. He literally, he is feuding with Hulk Hogan technically. So basically, you can't really do anything with that. So he's going to take on, take off, take out the people that Hulk Hogan brought to the company. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this. Bully Ray, come, when we come back from commercial break, once again, Bully Ray congratulates Aces and Eights for their attack on Kurt Angle, then turns their attention to the camera, once again asking Hulk Hogan to fire them. Bully Ray lists the people they've taken out, then that he's destroyed Hulk Hogan's family, and alludes to destroying the show itself. That's just what we're going to do. We see a video package talking about Bully's turn, and Brooks' reactions to his turn is a reveal. But it's main event time. And a double comes out to the ring with Bobby Roode, and here comes Sting. This is going to be awesome. So, as usual, we come back from commercial break. Actually, I'll start at the last bit of it. So, Sting grabs Aries and tosses him back into the guardrail, working the crowd as we go to break. And when we come back, we're back in the ring, Sting on full control, and Aries fights back with a forearm, but he gets clotheslined over the top rope and out to the arena floor. Rude tries to distract Sting, but the ref throws him out, so Bobby Rude's going to the back. This distraction does work as Aries goes on to the offense with a suicide dive onto Sting, sending him back into the guardrail. He rolls Sting back into the ring, but only gets the two count. He hits the running elbow drop, only gets the two count again. He continues assault with a drop kick to the back of seated Sting for another two count. Aries back Sting into the corner. Sting fights out with a series of elbows. He quickly gets the advantage, does Aries with a drop kick back to the knee. Aries goes to work over Sting's knee once again. He's mocking Sting to try to apply the Scorpion Deathlock, but he can't figure out how to do it. It's quite comical, actually. Sting just kicks him off. Sting fights back with a series of rights, dropping him with a clothesline. Sting connects with a right elbow, and Aries goes to the canvas. He goes with the Scorpion Deathlock, but Aries smartly rolls out to the apron and drops Sting throat first all across the top rope. Nails the missile drop kick off the top rope. Sting immediately gets back up, completely no-selling him. As Aries celebrates the move and basically turns around, Sting standing, and he poses. He picks him up into a military press and goes for the Stinger Splash, but this time he moves out of the way. Aries hits the running drop kick in the corner and goes for another one this time and locks up the Brain Buster. Sting floats over, reverses the Scorpion Death Drop. Tremendous counter right there. Sting goes for the Stinger Splash again. Scorpion Deathlock. Here comes Aces and Eights. And we got a no contest. Actually, in this case, Sting wins by DQ. 15-minute match and awesome. I want to see these guys go again without any question. I'll tell you right now, this is one of Sting's best matches I've seen in a long time. I want Austin Aries and Sting to wrestle again and again and again. I want to see them face off many, many times. So after the match is over, Aces and Eights continue to beat on Sting. Bully Ray gets on the mic and asks Hogan if this was memorable enough. He continues to call on Hulk Hogan as we cut to commercial. And when we come back from commercial, Bully's still in the ring begging for Hogan to come out. And then here comes Hulk Hogan on crutches. Standing on the entrance ramp, telling Bully Ray firing aces and eights would be the coward's way out after what they've done. They're not getting the easy way out because every dog has its day. Hogan says from this moment forward, he is empowering every man and woman from the TNA locker room to band together in an attempt to eliminate Aces and Aids. Jeff Hardy's music hits, he comes out along with the entire babyface and heel locker room, and they come out to attack. So we have a huge brawl. Aces and Aids take control. Bully enters the ring with a mic, and he once again asks Hogan, how is this for memorable, before attacking each roster member with his chain. So Bully exits to the ramp, staring Hogan down with a smile on his face. So Ray Tur tells Hogan that was his cavalry, and his cavalry just got killed by the Aces and Aids. Ray tells Hogan furthermore what he's going to do, and the former Team 3D stare Hogan down on the ramp as we fade out. So, the brawl started off really hot, and then basically everyone kind of went through the motions towards the end because they were kind of waiting for Bully to make the point, and that's basically what we're leading to. Once Bully got on the mic, everything got great as usual because Bully Ray is amazing. Wanting to know who will step up for TNA to stop Aces and Eights. You know, right now, it could be AJ Styles, or it could be a rejuvenated Sting. It could be anyone at this point. It could be someone that's not even in the company right now. So who's going to stop Aces and Eights? Questions 
will be answered in the near future. And I'll tell you, I enjoyed the show. I really did. Austin Aries and Sting, great match right there. And I like what they're doing with Aces and Eights. They uh, went down a little bit, locked down, but they picked right back up again on this week. And they looked a lot more like a devastating force and not just a job squad, which is basically what they were at one point. So I like what they did with Aces and Eights this week. It's interesting to see what's going to happen. And we've had a lot of bad booking between with what's going on in Aces and Eights and the time that they've been a part of TNA. And I'm telling you right now, basically, this episode did a lot to rectify that. Obviously, it's not going to be taken care of overnight, but they did a lot to rectify it. And uh, good news right there, to be totally honest, for TNA, because they actually made it work last night. And I was very happy with the episode. So that's pretty much my opinions on what's going on with impact from last night. Wrestling fans, once again, we will talk Monday Night Raw on Tuesday, afternoon or morning or evening. Depends on how I can work everything out. Probably Tuesday evening, actually. We'll do that and we'll talk Raw and that'll be fun, as usual. And, of course, I've got a WrestleMania special podcast coming up on April 7th. I will be live at Will's house for WrestleMania, and uh, we will be talking with the people at the house about their WrestleMania opinions. And this will be filmed, obviously, for everyone's consumption on this channel. So keep watching for that. And tomorrow, obviously, we are going to talk about... What is it, Sunday? We're going to talk about AJ's Weekend Movie Reviews in the near future. Obviously, Saturday we have something... Completely out of the ordinary, Sunday will be AJ's Weekend Movie Reviews, and of course Monday we're going to talk Celebrity Apprentice. So that's pretty much what's coming up, and once again, until tomorrow, that's all i got to say about that.